Okay, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Philip Arguris. He's going to be telling us about the extended vertex algebra of four-dimensional n equals two superconformal quantum field theories. Feel free to start whenever you're ready. Great. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. Oops, sorry. I have to get my pencil out here. Um, let me uh, 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 apologize in advance. This will be more physics than math, really. Um, <clears throat> I realized when I was trying to, to describe it that the, the construction of the vertex algebras that I want to, to talk about uh, comes from um, a construction in four-dimensional quantum field theory. So most of the talk has to be about things that we do in four-dimensional quantum field theory. So my idea is um, I will... Oh, hold on a sec. Let me get this my pen out. I will, I, I will spend a little time trying to give you some kind of introduction to quantum field theories, and then specifically conformal field theories and superconformal field theories, and those are the ones that we're going to look at—a very symmetrical version of quantum field theories—and um, then talk about the construction uh, of from Beam et al. from about ten years ago of a vertex operator algebra, which naturally sits inside these superconformal field theories, and then our construction of an, ex of an enlarged vertex algebra that also, that also sits there naturally, which has some interesting features, but is sort of with the, uh, I'd like to, like to bring this to a mathematical audience because there's a sort of a math question, which is, uh, how to understand the structure of this extended uh, vertex algebra. So anyway, that's that's the plan. So <clears throat> just as a high level, oh, and by the way, feel free to interrupt at any time with questions. Um, so a high level introduction, uh, where does this problem come from, at least from the physicist's perspective? Well, we're interested in understanding quantum field theories. And by quantum field theory, I'll mean a quantum theory that's in Minkowski space-time, so it's relativistic, and also obeys certain basic uh, physical characteristics, basic local, causal, stable, so that it kind of describes what we think of as a reasonable physical system. So I will tell you, give you a little idea mathematically of what you're supposed to think of a quantum field theory is, but the physical intuition um, is, and this is the picture that uh, I think most physicists have in their mind when they think of a quantum field theory, is think of a classical system, which is a set of masses laid out in say a lattice or an array with, inter with, with forces between nearest neighbors. <clears throat> like here, these are like, the, the orange balls are masses and the blue squiggly things are springs. They don't have to be linear springs. And then imagine, so this would be, a, a this is in two spatial dimensions and it evolves in time. And if you quantize that system and at the same time take a large volume limit in which you, or, or you look at very, very large scales, this thing goes, has some sort of continuum description, which we think of as a quantum field theory. It's not obvious that it has relativistic invariance. In fact, you'd have to do you'd have to be very careful about tuning the system so that it does. But um, that's the uh, that's the that's the basic idea that we have in mind. So I'll come back to this maybe a little bit later on to explain a few things. But um, the problem is that um, uh, understanding and in particular computing in quantum field theories is very difficult problem. All the quantum field theories that we see in nature, there are no, uh, there, there are no quantities or, or, or aspects of these theories that we, that we can compute exactly analytically, um, except for a very small subset of quant quantities which are protected by symmetries of the theory. And when they have symmetries of the theory, those give rise to things called conservation laws. So, there's a few exact statements having to do with the conservation of certain quantities, energy, momentum, so forth in the theory. And other than that, there's very little that we can say exactly. We have all sorts of approximate techniques. And of course, we si simulate these things numerically, but that's a far cry from understanding in a, in a more rigorous way what, what 
can and does go on in these theories. So uh, since symmetries are our best bet, the program that I and many, many other people follow is to look at more or less the most symmetric version of field theories we can, can, can come up with, which are um, still look something like uh, physical field theories. And these are so-called superconformal field theories. So I'll tell you a little bit about them. But the basic idea is they give us the, the, the best prospects for making precise statements. And indeed, <clears throat> um, over the past 25 years, we've learned a great deal about using uh, supersymmetry and superconformal invariance to, to extract um, exact predictions from these theories. But there was a, a striking breakthrough about 10 years ago by uh, Beam and company who, who recognized that these theories or certain classes of these theories, and the ones I'll be talking about are four-dimensional N equals two superconformal field theories. That's a certain class of these theories. There are other classes which have this property, but these are the ones I'll focus on. They have a protected sector, meaning protected by the symmetries. So something that is um, that we can say um, exact statements about, and they take it takes the form of a whole vertex operator algebra of observables, and these can be in in nice cases precisely characterized. So we know exactly what the vertex operator algebra corresponding to a given one of these. Uh, theories is, which is, which has played a, a large role in understanding the physics of these theories. So <clears throat> what I want to tell you about today is some work that I've done with um, Matteo Latito and uh, Mitch Weaver, um, where using a slight a generalization of topological descent, which I'll remind you of in a little bit, we are able to show that the vertex operator algebra that was identified as sort of a kind of a universal protected sector of these theories is actually not the whole story. There's a larger vertex algebra, technically a Mobius vertex algebra, which contains the vertex operator algebra as a proper subalgebra. So I'm going to try to tell you about how these, what the, the physics the connection is between these sets of field theories and vertex operator algebras and the construction of this vertex algebra. Okay. So, so now I'll start with a very quick review of uh, uh, or introduction to. Maybe I, I have a question, if you don't mind. Yes, is it reasonable to think of what you just said before as? For instance, the Neve Schwartz sector for n equals two would be the VOA, and somehow you build a big BA that has the Neve Schwartz and the Ramon sector. I mean, is as an this is as an as an analogy, you're saying. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would it be something yeah. of the of that flavor? Um, it, it it is something of that flavor, um, uh, very much so. In fact, it, I mean, it, uh. I haven't emphasized that too much in what I'm going to say now, but towards the end, if you ask that question again, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll point good. out the way in which it's something, it feels somewhat similar to that. But again, this is an analogy, not a precise. Gotcha. Okay, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> so our setting is space-time, which we can just think of as a four real dimensional vector space. It's not really a vector space. There's nothing special about the origin. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll label some uh, uh, coordinates uh, x mu, mu going from one to four, and we put on a Minkowski metric, um, which is not positive definite. So it's minus x1, so we would call x1 a time-like coordinate, and then x2 and x3 and x4 are space-like coordinates, okay? And then um, the symmetries of our field theory are going to be the isometries of this space, which is the Poincaré group, its Lie algebra is Lorentz transformations, SO3 comma one, and translations. So um, the cars, the generators of that this Lie algebra are the things called the conserved charges in the physics language. Those are the energy and momentum. Those are the generators of translations. And then there's angular momentum and similar things for generators of the rotations and Lorentz transformations. 
Okay, I'm introducing this notation because th it, these will this it, it, these will play a role in what comes. So I'm going to ask you to remember at least what that M are rotations and P are generator of translations. <clears throat> so the the main actors are fields. Um, uh, or uh, I call them, and most people now call them, local operators. And um, uh, th they are a, a family of objects uh, labeled by the points in space-time. And uh, they, the op as objects, you can think of them as linear operators acting on the Hilbert space um, uh, that underlies the quantum mechanics of this system. Okay. And there's a, um, a, a denumerably a infinite uh, set of these um, objects. Uh, that's, and, <clears throat> and, they, and as operators, they themselves form a vector space. So we can add operators, multiply them by complex numbers, and so forth. And the, the operators at one value of x are related to the operators at the other, another value of x by an action of the translation generator. So th this is like some sort of a adjoint action or it, 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 these will be some unitary operators acting on the Hilbert space. And here I'm just conjugating by this operator and that defines the action on these operators. But in some sense, it's telling us that the symmetry of translation variance relates operators at any one point to operators at, a, at any other point. Okay, so what are these operators physically? We're supposed to think of them as corresponding to measurements of our system at localized at that point in space and time. The idea is they correspond in some sense to disturbing my, my system by picking a point in space and at a specific time doing something like displacing this mass by a certain amount. And that's an operator that would correspond to the the, the kind of the effect of one of these these operators, so <clears throat> we the, the, we call them measurements because in quantum mechanics, measuring a system and disturbing the system are more or less the same concept. Um, <clears throat> um, okay, so what is it that we actually compute in quantum mechanics? You compute uh, probabilities in quantum mechanics. And the probabilities are in quantum mechanics are the squares of complex numbers, and those complex numbers are called amplitudes. And so, um, one set of uh, of of amplitudes, um, a, a very large set of amplitudes, is we can imagine um, performing uh, n of these localized exp experiments, and then taking some sort some appropriate kind of uh, ensemble average, or, or it's not in, that's not quite an ensemble average, but um, a, a vacuum expectation value of these things. This gives some complex number. Its absolute value square gives you some probability distribution for certain questions in quantum mechanics, OK? So the, 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 in the end, end um, I'm, I'm sweeping under the rug certain properties that these distributions must have in order to qualify as, as probability distributions in quantum mechanics. But these are the objects that we're interested in, these correlation functions, and they're functions from n copies of space-time into the complex numbers. Um, and, and as long as we and, uh, and we as long as we keep different pairs of points separate. <clears throat> okay, this is the main thing that we're interested in in uh, in quantum field theory. Not the only thing, but the main. Thing. So, um, um, one way of analyzing the properties of this class of 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 uh, correlation functions is to ask for their behavior as I take one of the space time points close to another one of the space time points where I'm doing a disturbance. And this gives rise to an operator algebra. And the idea from locality is that if I take them close enough, they look uh, in the limit that x approaches 0 in this case, it looks like some new local disturbance 
um, at, localized at the point zero. So I should be able to rewrite this as some sort of um, uh, linear, uh, um, uh, linear combination of a basis of local operators at the point zero. And this is called the operator product expansion in, uh, in field theory. And in general field theories, this is actually only an asymptotic expansion, it has zero radius of convergence. And when you work in Minkowski space, um, it also, the coefficients have singularities everywhere along the light cone. So not just when the points coincide. So it's a little bit more delicate of an expansion. And so let me tell you, just because it's going to play a big role in what follows, what this, what the light cone is, it's, it's the set of points with uh, norm zero in this, uh, uh, or, uh, or distance from the origin is uh, our zero in the Minkowski metric. So that's the ones where the, the time coordinate squared is equal to the sum of the spatial coordinates squared. So it looks like some kind of cone in space time. So here I've drawn a picture of the light cone, okay? So x1 again is time, x2, 3, 4 are space, and this, the, the, this purple cone are the set of points which are what we would call light-like separated from the origin. <clears throat> um, okay. So now I'm going to take, take this very uh, vague and uh, high-level uh, description of field theory, and now I'm going to specialize by adding on extra symmetries. We already had a symmetry, which was which was Poincaré invariance. That was translations and rotations, but um, we can enlarge it to a conformal symmetry um, uh, by adding dilatations, which are scale self similarity under scale transformations, and another set of symmetries called special conformal transformations. They form a co the conformal group of Minkowski space which as a, um, the, the algebra of that group is, the, a real form is SO, uh, SOD comma two. So I'm sorry, we were, I was working in, um, I guess I was working in four dimensions. So it's SO four comma two. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, so I, uh, I, I won't give you any more details. So you, you could figure out the mapping if you like between uh, some the set of generators that I've said and this SO4 comma two. Um, but let me point out one special case when D is equal to two, um, this becomes, oops, becomes SO3 comma one, which over the complexes at least is SL2 plus uh, two, two copies of SL2, which I'll call SL2 and SL2 bar. Um, um, uh, so, I, so I can divide up, make linear combinations of the P's and K's and M's. Um, and I'll call those combinations, as is common now, the generators of the SL2, L minus one, L0, and L1, and of the SL2 bars, L minus one bar, L0 bar, and L plus one bar. These will play a role as well. Um, and um, if you've uh, uh, been looking at two-dimensional conformal field theories or uh, vertex algebras or conformal vertex algebras, um, these set of generators are modes of the Virasoro field or the energy, or sometimes also called the energy momentum uh, tensor in, in vertex algebras. And, and for instance, in Katz's uh, book, uh, Vertex Algebras for Beginners, these L minus one is the translation operator. L zero is what he calls the Hamiltonian, which is also what, which often gives the gra a, a grading whose eigenvalues give the, the a, a grading of the vertex algebra. And L plus one is the operator he calls T star. So, <clears throat> This is just foreshadowing of once we get to the VOA story, that there is there is this connection of things which enter into the VOA with which with some subset, a kind of a two a two dimensional subset of the of the conformal algebra. Okay, so 
what's interesting from the field theory point of view is once you have a conformal symmetry together with um, certain other technical assumptions, the operator product expansion, which I mentioned before, becomes much more uh, constrained and much more useful. In fact, it has a finite radius of convergence. Um, it's, I should say, in Minkowski space, it still has, its coefficients still have singularities along light cones, along light light separations, but that actually doesn't affect the convergence as long as you understand it to be converging in a distributional sense. So this is something that's some been pretty much worked out in the physics uh, community. So we can still use the OPE uh, that it, it, um, in a in a kind of a rigorous way in um, in uh, in Lorentzian field theories, field theories that are actual quantum mechanical theories in in Minkowski space, as opposed to the Euclidean theories, which aren't actual quantum mechanical theories. <clears throat> Um, the, the form of the operator product expansion is um, with a certain restriction on these operators to so-called primary or quasi-primary operators. Um, they, um, they have the same form as I wrote, writ, wrote before, but the, uh, the, the, the structure of the x-dependence of the, of the terms that appear here is completely fixed by the symmetry and all that's left unfixed just by the conformal symmetry is a set of complex kind of structure constants of this algebra. So this is a dramatic simplification in the, the so sort of the, the set of data that you need to specify these things. If you know these, the, these, these structure constants, and since these, these OPEs converge, have finite radius of convergence, you can just use analytic continuation to reconstruct all the correlation functions with arbitrary numbers of insertions just from knowing the, the, this operator algebra data, okay? And furthermore, um, th these can't be arbitrary constants. There are nonlinear constraints among these constants coming from associativity of this algebra, which strongly cons constrains what they can be. And physicists for the past 10 years have been using this to great effect to actually um, to find numerical methods, effective numerical methods of computing in conformal field theories. And now again, let's go to our, our, our Euclidean two-dimensional example. And uh, there uh, we had a sort of a holomorphic and an anti-holomorphic um, uh, half of our uh, of our Euclidean conformal algebra. And if you are allowed to, for some reason, restrict yourself just to a holomorphic half of your, of your two-dimensional conformal field theory, then the operator product expansion simplifies even further. Um, it, it looks, uh, has the same structure we had before, but uh, it only depends on the holomorphic uh, separation, if you like, between the insertions. And uh, and it has it only has poles. These n i j k are some set of integers which depend on properties of these um, of of these operators, so are sort of determined by the symmetries. And when you have this structure, this is essentially uh, the what's called this is what physicists would recognize as a vertex algebra. We call it um, a chiral algebra in physics. It's essentially the same thing, and the and one motivation for the definition of vertex algebras. And uh, Katz's uh, book, Vertex Algebras for Beginners, the first chapter, he, he actually walks through what I've just done. He, he talks about an axiomatic description of quantum field theories, restricts to two dimensions, restricts to the holomorphic half, and out comes the definition of vertex algebras. Written in this form, which might look a little unfamiliar to you, I'm not sure exactly uh, that's this is this this physics notation for the operator product expansion to to encode the vertex uh, to encode the vertex algebra is is maybe not the one that the mathematicians are most used to seeing. I'm not sure. 
I think it's pretty close, except maybe we would, instead of have zero, we would have another W insertion. Oh, oh, oh yeah, I, I, just mm -hmm. used the, I just used the fact that everything's translation invariant. Mm -hmm. So all that really mattered was the difference between Z and W. So I just put one of them at zero, just because I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. But you're right, this should be Z minus W in here, and this should be W. And w. <clears throat> okay, good. So now let's go back to our general field theories and add in supersymmetry. So what is supersymmetry? Well, our symmetry algebra, instead of being a Lie algebra, is now a super Lie algebra. That is to say it has some odd generators that which satisfy, you know, have their their Lie brackets are um, are anti commutators instead of commut commutators, um, um, and those extra fermionic charges go by the general name of supercharges in um, in uh, in physics. I have no idea. I mean, this is a silly name. This whole supersymmetry business, but anyway, we're stuck with it now. And um, the the we're it. The, Super Lie algebras, which can be interesting um, symmetries of physical systems, maybe I'll say a word in a second, what interesting means, are ones in which the supercharges can close on the translations, the supercharges are translation invariant, and this is just the statement that the supercharges transform in some representation of the Lorentz group. In particular, they should be in spinner representations by spin statistics. So what did I what do I mean by this is interesting? Well, <clears throat> uh, you can Im you could imagine putting in other fermionic supercharges, but if they if they don't have an an algebra which kind of has this basic uh, form, um, then you can show that they um, that uh, the symmetry um, is too much. It constrains it so that there's that the that the result of the quantum of the of the resulting quantum field theory is essentially forced to be free. It doesn't have any inter interesting interactions. So we're trying to put as much symmetry as possible, but not too much, right? <clears throat> There's, so then um, uh, uh, super conform. So we have conformal symmetry, super symmetry. So we can put them together and have super conformal symmetry. Um, for the cases that I'm looking at, this is this particular uh, simple uh, Lie superalgebra in the in the standard notation. Um, it has a bosonic part, which is the conformal algebra. Another bosonic part, which is called the R symmetry. I'm going to, from now on, for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to drop reference to this, but it's always really there, and I'm so. And it sort of doubles the number of supercharges. In addition to the supercharges um, uh, that close on the translations, there's some, something called a set of conformal supercharges, which close on the special conformal transformations. And then there's non-trivial uh, Lie brackets between the supercharges and, um, and, uh, super, and conformal supercharges that closes on rotations and dilatations. So, and again, okay, it, in, in, in principle, I've given you all the information you need to know about what this symmetry algebra is here by giving it its name, but I'm not going to give you any more details than this. So what, I, instead, I want to tell you what supersymmetry is good for. <clears throat> what does it buy us in quantum field theories? And one of the main tricks that's been understood since uh, the late 80s, the work of, uh, of Witten on, on, uh, in, on what's now called Donaldson-Witten theory, um, is if you have a quantum field theory with a supersymmetry, you can find, pick a supercharge which is nilpotent. Not all supercharges are nilpotent in the algebra. Sometimes they close on other stuff, but there are certain linear combinations of the supercharges that you can pick, which are in fact nilpotent. Um, and then you can look at the, you can pass to the cohomology of this supercharge. And that that defines a supersymmetric sector or a, a, uh, a, 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 a 
a protected subsector of the quantum field theory. And th this has been this trick, and, and this is often called twisting the quantum field theory by the supercharge. So I'll call it the quantum field theory sub Q as the Q twisted field theory. And all it says is I'm only going to look at the, oper the local operators in the theory, which are annihilated by my nilpotent supercharge. And I'll consider the equivalence relation if two supercharges are equivalent if they differ by an exact piece, by Q of something else, some other local operator. So these um, equivalence classes, are going to now form the fields of my twisted uh, um, quantum field theory. And this is a good definition because then it, it, it follows, I, I won't give the details, but it's pretty, pretty immediate with the definition of the correlation functions that the correl correlators of these operators only depend on their uh, cohomology classes. And furthermore, <clears throat> these correlators um, are so this these correla correlators are sort of automatically constrained to depend only on a subspace of all possible points in space time generically and i'll call this subspace the kind of configuration space of the of the twisted field theory and i'll call it uh, c here okay so th this is the 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 basic result that if you have supersymmetry you can by you can pass to these these uh, kind of smaller sub field theories that are um, uh, um, and, um, and 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 these are uh, and these turn out to be interesting much simpler subsectors of the field theory that are uh, much more amenable to to study in particular. The vertex operator algebra, a beam and company, the vertex algebra that I'm talking about are examples of these things. And in the original work of Witten, he chose a twist in which when he twisted it, the twisted subsector was a purely topological field theory, a very simple kind of field theory with a, a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So, <clears throat> so this is the most technical part, I think. Well, I don't know. I, I need to give a, a little bit of um, of uh, a background as to where where these properties of our twisted field theory come from. So the tr the the idea for analyzing these is we should actually look at the Q cohomology of the superconformal algebra itself. In particular, of the superconformal algebra, which I remind you is this is this specific superconformal algebra with some you know set of generators <clears throat> um, so, so, so some specific Lie super algebra I'll look at the subset of of let's 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 go well, let's look at the conformal algebra well, let's just look at these bosonic generators um, I'll look at the subset of these bosonic generators which are annihilated by the supercharge this these would be the Q closed generators I'll call that Z and then there's a subset of that, which are the ones which are not only Q closed, but actually Q exact. That they are themselves Q of some fermionic generator in the algebra. Okay. And um, it, 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 it follows very quickly. You can actually see that Z and B are actually Lie subalgebras of, of my conformal algebra in this way. Um, <clears throat> so it's these sets, the, the closed and exact set of generators of my conformal algebra, which are the, the, the things that we want to keep in mind. And now it follows, and looking at the time, I'll, I'll go a little quickly here, but it follows then that if you act with any of these um, uh, closed generators on one of your, uh, one of your uh, uh, a local field in cohomology, you get, um, it will create a, a new local field in, in cohomology. And um, if it's exact, then uh, acting with it um, uh, will, will give something that's uh, trivial in cohomology and so won't change the correlator. So as a result of that, 
if I take any point in space time and act on it with the action of some conformal generator uh, that is it, one of these closed generators, I will generate, if I look at the orbit of this point under this action of the conformal group, it will give me a set of positions of my operators in space time, which, which will also be um, uh, uh, closed under the, uh, 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 also annihilated by the supercharge. So will uh, will be uh, appropriate places where I can put where I could put cohomology classes of my um, um, uh, yeah co cohomology classes of my um, of 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 my given my chosen uh, supercharge Q that I'm twisting by. So um, and then furthermore. Uh, if I, if I look at the subspace of this space, which is given by, by the orbits of the exact generators, doing these transformations, because they're exact, do not change the value of the correlation functions. So you find the correlation functions are correlation functions of these classes of operators that can be put at points only in this subspace of space-time, but, but the actual correlation functions only depend on the space-time modulo, the action of the of of the exact generators. Okay, I probably did not say that as clearly as I hoped, but here is a very simple example, the the original example, the so-called Donaldson-Witten twist of the same class of field theories that I'm talking about, these 4D n equals two theories, except that they could do the twist. They didn't use the conformal algebra; they just used the the super Poincaré algebra. And they picked a nilpotent supercharge such that all translations, all space-time translations were exact. Well, what that means, and therefore closed, and what that means is that the whole of space-time was th this uh, space of allowed positions of these operators could be anywhere in space-time. Um, but, um, the uh, the configuration space mod the exact generators was then just a point. That's another way of saying that the that you could put the coral you, you could put your your twisted correlate correlation function of your of your twisted cohomology classes anywhere you liked in space time, but they would not depend on the position that you put them in. So they they would be called that that would be the indication that this is a topological field theory. It doesn't depend depend on the distances between the, uh, the insertions. Um, so here are some post, some references if you wanted. This is the original reference and there's some very nice review that actually spent, doesn't work in four dimensions, but in two and three dimensions um, by Garner and Paquette, just much more recent. Um, <clears throat> okay. Maybe I'll pause here for questions. I know I just dumped a lot on you, but that was the, the, the quick review of field theories, conformal field theories, super conformal field theories. And now I'm gonna take this uh, machinery, if you like, and following Beam et al. from 10 years ago, um, uh, take four dimensional N equals two super conformal field theories and twist them. And the all that's required is finding the right nilpotent uh, supercharge to twist by, and um, that's so that's what they did. They they point out that if they choose this supercharge, a certain sup a certain combination of a, a a a supercharge and a conformal supercharge, then this is a nilpotent operator, and if you twist by it, you get something interesting. Okay, the, the specific operator I wrote down here doesn't really matter, and obviously it only depends. You know, it's actually just one any. Tr it, it's just a representative of an orbit under the automorphism group of the uh, of the super algebra. But I've, here I've just taken a concrete representation of it, and I called it Q plus. 
But I've written a second one called Q minus. And so there's two different twists. They are not related by an automorphism. Each one is nilpotent. They're, they don't actually anti-commute with one another. So uh, I could look at, I could twist by Q plus, or I could twist by Q minus a priori. <clears throat> so um, let's, let, uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to do both of them in parallel here. I could look at the subset of the conformal algebra, the, of the superconformal algebra, which is um, closed under Q plus or Q minus. I'll call that Z plus minus. And that has an S, one of these SL2 factors that we pointed out before. So these, I'll call them these generators. They're like a holo, they correspond, the L minus is like the holomorphic translation in some space-like two plane in space time. And um, plus the exact generators and the, ex, and the exact generators, the, which B plus or B minus, is then the anti-holomorphic half together with some other algebra. I'm not, um, I'm not gonna write it out for you at the moment, but a bunch of other generators that depend on whether it's plus or minus. And let's just concentrate for the moment of where the translation generators in space-time reside. Um, so take the, it, this, with this specific choice of superchar picks out, you know, breaks the symmetries, picks out some directions in space time. And in particular, the SL2 translation, the L minus one generator is the holomorphic derivative in the, in a complex coordinate Z, which is the X3 plus I X4 direction where three and four were two of the space-like directions. And of course, L, L twiddle minus one is the Z bar derivative. That's the complex conjugate coordinate in that plane. And then here, depending on whether I'm using the Q plus or the Q minus generator, um, an exact translation is either P plus or P minus, where P plus is this linear combination of, of translations in the time-like direction and a space-like direction or with a minus sign. So these are called light-like translation vectors, okay? Um, so let, let's try to kind of uh, pi picture this uh, geometrically, uh, because this will tell us uh, what the configuration space in space-time, how I can, I can translate things. So um, let, let me write it like this. Let's say I'm looking at the Q plus generator. Then this is my all, these three guys are closed, with, and these two guys are exact. So my configuration space consists of all points, let's say starting from the origin, in which I translate along the ZZ bar plane, that's the three, four plane, and along and or along this, this specific light-like direction transverse to it. So it forms a complex Euclidean subspace of Minkowski space cross a, a light-like line, the X plus direction. And that would be the configuration space in the in the Q plus cohomology. For the Q minus cohomology, it's just this other transverse light-like line. So these would be the two configuration spaces. But if you look at these configuration space and mod out by the exact generators, all that's left is the correlation functions only depend on this holomorphic coordinate. So no matter where I put my, uh, my, my cohomology classes, my 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 operators, which are in non-trivial um, Q plus say cohomology classes, the resulting correlators only care about the holomorphic coordinate of those of those um, insertions as they lie along the uh, in this ZZ bar plane. Okay. And so here I've drawn, uh, here I, again, I've draw, drawn our light cone and here I've drawn what the kind of the X plus axis looks like and the X minus axis, they're transverse to this plane. I've just run out of dimension. So I just wrote it as a line. And the, the end result is that when I go to either one of these twisted sectors, I get a set of correlation functions, which are functions of that are that 
uh, depend only holomorphically on a coordinate in this, this two-dimensional uh, plane. And they can have possible poles at zi equals ej. That together with various um, uh, properties of the underlying field theory, locality, and so forth, means that it actually satisfies all the um, uh, um, these correlation functions, and, and in particular, the, the, the associated um, operator algebra um, that comes from taking limits as one of these insertions approaches another one, satisfies all the axioms of, of, uh, of, a, of a vertex algebra. Um, as I'll point out maybe in a second, th th it's actually a little bit more than the axioms of a vertex algebra. It's something which Katz calls a Mobius vertex algebra. I don't know if that's still common terminology, but I'll tell you what that is in a second. It's There's some extra uh, uh, properties that are involved here that, that just come from this whole setup. So <clears throat> there are some subtler constraints on, on the four-dimensional superconformal field theory that physicists called unitarity, which is a, another way of just saying that it has a consistent quantum mechanical interpretation, um, which then um, uh, have some, some non-obvious uh, um, consequences. So I'm just gonna list them for you here and tell you which ones we know how to prove and which ones we don't. Uh, the first is that maybe unexpectedly, I had two different twistings by this supercharge and this supercharge and they give exactly the same uh, vertex algebra. When I twist, doesn't if I the twisted sector with respect to Q plus is exactly the same as the twisted sector with respect to Q minus. Um, the, uh, the, 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 these vertex algebras are graded vertex algebras. They're graded by the eigenvalue of that L zero operator. And it turns out that those, the, the eigenvalues of the L0 operator are all half integers, uh, non-negative half integers. Um, and another thing that you can uh, immediately show is that there exists a vertex operator or a, a field in this vertex algebra um, whose OPE with itself is the, is the usual Virasoro OPE. So this would be called like, I guess, a, a Virasoro operator. Um, uh, so um, th this is uh, uh, maybe a little bit unexpected. Um, um, there's two other properties which in specific cases can be checked in many, many specific cases can be checked, but for which no general proof exists. I don't, one is that at each grading, the dimension of the corresponding vector space is fine, cars, uh, of operators is finite dimensional. Um, we kind of expect this to be true for any well-behaved field theory, but we don't have a way of yet of proving it. And, and more importantly, um, this uh, um, it's it's not ob it's not a priori obvious that the 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 mode operators defined for the Virasoro operators given by this expression that these these mode operators coincide with what I call the L minus one L zero and L one operators which were operators after all which were symmetry operators conserved charges in the underlying um, uh, four-dimensional conformal algebra, okay? However, in a huge class of field theories, this is known to be true. And um, it can be, and and there's there's something close to a general proof. I don't know if close, I don't know what, what it means to have something close to a general proof. But for, 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 for general uh, conformal field theories, you can show that these operators act um, in the right way. In particular, 
Okay, let me just leave it at that. So we we, we strongly, we have a, 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 a large amount of evidence, let's put it this way, that these two properties are also satisfied for all um, uh, 4D n equals two superconformal field theories. If you have a vertex algebra that satisfies these properties, then it's a vertex operator algebra or a sometimes called a conformal vertex algebra. Okay. So this was this beautiful result of Beam and company from 10 years ago. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. So maybe I should pause here for questions. I, I'm my 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 uh, my next step now. I'm going to tell I'm going to tell you about some the, the new parts of our construction. But the, I think there's a question, Philip, and you still have ten minutes, just so you know, because we've been interrupting. Okay. So okay, we, we're good on time. Shikinari, do you have a question? Go for it. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, do we have some meaning for the central charge from uh, for D theory? Uh, yeah. Very good. Yeah. So. Uh, th there's an there's an analog of the cent of central charges in uh, in four dimensional conformal field theories, um, but it turns out there's not one. There's two of them, which go by the names A and C central charges, and it turns out that this uh, the the Virasoro central charge here is related to it's I think it's uh, minus uh, twelve times the 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 the, the the thing that's called the C central charge in the four dimensional conformal field theory. And that's something that was proved by um, whoever, by Beam and company. And mm -hmm. it, so it turns out that the central charge of the uh, of, of these ver vertex operator algebras is closely related to something that you can, uh, a property of the 4D theory. And in general, there's a there's a whole beautiful sort of dictionary between certain properties of the four-dimensional field theory and how they're reflected in in these vertex algebras. I see. Great, thank you. Yeah. I guess I have a follow-up question. And this A that you mentioned, is it yeah. related to any of the data of the of the vertex algebra or VOA? That's a that's a good question. And it's certainly a it it, it 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 there's the via the the verte the voa encodes information which um w which we know it, it which from the four dimensional point of view clearly is it involves the a central charge along with lots of other stuff so it is mixed in there but not in some obvious way gotcha thanks yeah. um Maybe I can say something a little bit more, which is that in the VOA, you can extract from it using a certain deformation procedure, a, a certain Poisson algebra, and the um, and it's in the structure of that Poisson algebra that the, that the A as well as the C ends up being reflected along with lots of other stuff. Um, again, if you just look at the work uh, Beam and Rastelli over the last ten years, you will, you there, there must be, must have at least a dozen papers exploring exactly questions like this. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm so I'm running out of time, <laughs> and I'm um, so I wanted to get very quickly to uh, to the new stuff, um, and. The idea is we want to, I, I want to say, I'm going to stay in this twisted shore cohomology of the VOA. I just want a procedure for, for constructing new cohomology classes that they missed, essentially. Back in the, in the example of the um, Donaldson-Witten twist, the cohomology classes were some local operators, but maybe if you know anything about this Donaldson-Witten business, in the twist, they also had some topological line and surface operators. And in fact, it was the correlation functions of those line and surface operators, which are the interesting thing. Those are the things that, that end up computing the Donaldson invariance. It makes the whole story interesting. So where did those line and surface operators come from? They came from something called topological descent, which was appeared in the original paper by Witten. 
So what it is, is it takes one of the, the, the local operator cohomology classes and an associated um, operator in the, uh, in, the al in the conformal algebra, which is uh, ex Q exact, and by translating that operator and integrating it against a certain fermionic partner of M, in this sense, that's this mu here, you generate a, a new operator, but it's an operator that doesn't sit at one point in space, but it's at all the, the M translates of that point and integrate it along it. So if this, if, if this operator was a point operator, this operator here is some, some kind of extended operator going through the point X and the direction that it goes off is, is it, it's the orbit of X generated by this generator M. And this is called a the descent operator. And this, so you see, as long as the M moves X, it generates a line from a point. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to skip through things in this way. These automatically generate these descent operators are still in Q cohomology. You generate in this way a, 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 a you an enlarged uh, twisted uh, field theory consisted not not only of the correlators of the local operators but of these line descent operators, um, and then the, the 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 usual Q cohomology arguments then tell you that these resulting correlators are holomorphic in these points, x1 through xn, y1 through yn, and that's it. So the fact that these are extended operators in some sense doesn't matter as far as them, as these correlators go, it just gives an extension of the vertex algebra. So if they were holomorphic in the x1 through xn, they'll also be holomorphic in the y1 through yn. I've just found, an, I've constructed in this way a new class of vertex operators that weren't in the original vertex algebra. That's the idea. So that's what I'm saying here. And also the other thing is you can iterate the descent procedure. Once I've, once I've done this to a local operator, I can now stick in one of my descent operators and translate it in a new direction to get a surface operator and so forth. Okay, so that's what Donaldson and Witten do. They turn out all to be topological operators because they their twist gave a topological field theory. Iris does not give a topological field theory. Instead, it gives this vertex algebra. And so what we end up doing is just enlarging the vertex algebra. So um, cutting uh, to the chase here, if you take any local twisted shore operator, that's the one in the original VOA, I can do a descent uh, in the P plus direction. That's with respect to this uh, Q plus um, twisting charge to get a line operator that's extended that's extended in a light-like direction. Or I could have worked in Q minus cohomology and got a light uh, light light a line operator extended along in, again in a light-like direction, but in the opposite direction. And now the the magic, so to speak, that we don't have a clear physical explanation for, but the algebra just works out such that even though we were in doing this descent procedure, we were only ensuring that the line operator was going to be in Q plus cohomology, and this one over here would have been in Q minus cohomology, it turns out that they're that they're automatically also in Q minus and Q plus cohomology. So this descent procedure making these L plus lines and these L minus lines actually um, uh, automatically makes lines which are again in both both versions of the twisted field theory, the Q plus and Q minus. And that allows us to make further descents. Now I can take this guy and act on it with a with a P plus descendant to get a surface operator. And in fact, there's in gray here, there's it, it the tree doesn't quite stop there. There are other kinds of surface operators and, and domain wall operators as well, but they're a little they're they're a little bit more delicate. So I'm I'm just going to focus on this subsector, which is very well, it's clearly well defined. So here's the physical picture that we now have. This again is our four-dimensional space-time, time going up 
uh, the x2 direction here, and the x3 and x4 directions, I'm just writing as this z plane here. And then uh, uh, I can now I get to distribute along this plane, either local operators or L minus lines or L plus lines or these surface operators anywhere I like. And I can take the correlation function in, in, four, in the four-dimensional field theory of this set of extended operators. And what the, their answer only depends on these positions, their, their Z coordinates holomorphically or actually miromorphically. If they collide, they can have poles. And so they define a, um, a, 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 a vertex algebra. And in fact, because they inherit these uh, operators, this SL2 from the space-time uh, conformal algebra, it's a vertex algebra with a translation operator. Okay, that's part of the definition of the vertex operator. But then we also know that it is um, it is graded by the um, by the eigenvalues of the L zero operator. So it's a graded vertex algebra, and in addition. It has the the appropriate action of this con special conformal trans generator, the L plus one operator, and and having those three gives it a, the structure of what at least least Cass calls a Mobius vertex algebra. So these extended vertex algebras give us not uh, 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 the extension is uh, are are these are Mobius vertex algebras, but one thing that we have, which is very different from the way descent worked in the topological theories, is that in the topological theories, you could make new operators in the cohomology by the descent procedure, but that turns out that that's all you could get. In our case, it's not. We make these operators by descent, and now when you take the operator product of descent operators, they close on the right-hand side on new extended operators, which are themselves not made by descent from the local shore operators. So they're new extended operators in cohomology, in the cohomology. So that's the new thing. And that's part of the, the, the challenge of these algebras is that what we, have, we are defining the algebras by a, a set of generators, but uh, we kind of don't know what it closes on. So it's just whatever this, these, these things close on. And these things are fairly complicated to uh, to compute and characterize. Okay, <clears throat> so in my negative three minutes, just to give you a sense, I'm just gonna flash these things for you. Sorry, I ran out of time. Is we can take a an example conformal field theory. Let's take basically the simplest possible one, which is a free super conformal field theory in four dimensions of of some scalar fields and some uh, some spin a half fields called the free hypermultiplet superconformal field theory. Then long ago, Beam and company computed the vertex operator algebra, and it's it's a it's 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 it is itself a very simple vertex operator algebra. It's a current algebra called the free symplectic boson current algebra. Here is the, here are the, the 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 symplectic bosons, and here is the Vera Soro guy. Um, and so we could look at these guys. And now you can ask, what happens when you extend it? Well, then the Qs ha will have descent operators, which will be L plus and L minus line operators, as well as a, a surface operator associated to the Qs. And then you can ask what their OPEs are. And then you have to go ahead and compute the OPEs, not just of Q with Q, which is what we have here, but you know Q with S, Q with L plus and L minus and so forth. And it turns out these OPEs have a very simple form. They all have the same form. They close just up to some constant here, A. And so I just label, I, so I, I've just given you a table from doing the computations of what these guys are. And it already, even at this level, shows some interesting structure. Um, it, uh, we don't know exactly know how to prove this, but every everything we've computed in these theories is consistent with this extended algebra having a null state, which is that is Q minus S of Q. That only is for this Q operator. We could also talk about the 
um, the descendants of the of the Verasoro operator, for instance. There's other operators, of course, in this theory, but let's do that and talk about their OPEs. And they have some very kind of nice uh, structure, but they immediately show us that the thing which was the Verasoro operator uh, field for the in in this VOA sector no longer acts as the Verasoro operator in the extended VA. That it seems unlikely that our extended vertex algebra is a vertex operator algebra or a conformal algebra. In any case, we have not been able to locate a, an analog of a Verasoro operator in the extended vertex operator algebra. And finally, to show you the examples of new things that can appear which are not themselves descent operators that are in some sense normal ordered products of descent operators, you can now look in this theory at the operator product expansion of, of, descent, of the descent operators of the Virasoro operator itself. And um, so I'm gonna skip over this. Yeah, we can come back and look at it if you want. And let me, if you'll permit me um, just a minute to, to give you the high level summary. Um, the, so from a physics point of view, you know, line and surface operators, which we introduced here, are something that have been a mainstay of understanding quantum field theories for the last half century in quantum field theories. I mean, uh, they're called Wilson line operators and have been studied from the mid 70s and they're ascent, uh, are examples of these extended operators and they've been crucial for understanding the structure of gauge theories and quantum field theories in the real world. So they're, that, they're not new. But the problem is the operator algebra of the extended operators themselves is something that very little is known about, mostly because these, these uh, operators are kind of floppy. It's very hard to, to it, it's just, there's many different ways that these operators can kind of come close to one another in space time. Um, and so most of the results for their operator algebras only concern special theories in which these are end up being topological extended operators. And then there's all these beautiful things, modular tensor categories, blah, blah, blah. But if you're trying, if you're not in the topological category, then uh, not very much is known. And we're giving here an example by going to this twisted shore sector of these things where our extended operators are much better behaved. And as we as I just tried to outline for you, their operator algebra is this kind of well-defined mathematical object, this Mobius vertex algebra. One of the surprises from the physics point of view is it requires us to work in Minkowski space-time and, 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 and it uses crucially light-like world volumes for the whole thing to work. Um, that's a bit of a surprise. Generally, people have not worked in Minkowski space-time for some reasons of simplicity. Um, and then finally, the math challenge then is to understand the structure of these extended vertex algebras. And uh, I had some specific points here, but um, the vertex operator algebra oops, of Beam and Company was understood uh, some years ago, uh, in particular, I think Owen Yagi is one of the first works that did this, that you could understand um, the structure of the vertex operator algebra by as a certain limit of a whole uh, one parameter family of deform uh, of kind of deformations of this algebra which were them which were some other sort of uh, vertex algebra like structures so instead of having to use um, techniques in in your higher dimensional four dimensional field theory to compute the things in the vertex operator algebra, you could, you could pose it questions about the vertex operator algebra, just staying within the realm of vertex algebras. So maybe something that would be more accessible to mathematicians and using the tools that have been, just been, been uh, developed by the mathematical community. And so it's a, it's a question whether the same sort of deformation uh, relation uh, up, applies also to the, our extended vertex algebras. So thanks and sorry, sorry for going over time. 
Thank you so much. We're all here excited to learn about the physics behind vertex algebras or around vertex algebras. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. I'm going to stop the recording to see if anyone has any more questions. Sure.